Hey, thanks for joining us. This is Easter Sunday. Uh, it's referred to as Resurrection Sunday. It's also referred to, from this point forward, the Lord's Day, because it is the day that the Lord is risen. And, and the excitement that you have all over Christendom on this day is that the reality of who Jesus is is made true because of the resurrection. As a matter of fact, Paul talks about it in, and he says it this way. He says that if the resurrection did not take place, everything else we're doing is a complete waste of time. Now, that's my paraphrase, but that's essentially what he's saying here. If the resurrection is not true, everything else is a waste. And so our faith is realized the greatest expression of it in terms of holy days within Christendom is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, the Lord's Day. So welcome here as we get to talk about the implications of what this means. So if you got your Bible with you, I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 24. We're gonna be looking at verses 30, 13 to 35. Luke chapter 24, verse 13 to 35. And we really want to take like a real close look at Jesus. Now, I know that sounds like a strange thing, like Rob, don't we always do that? We do, uh, but today I want us to make, pay special attention to Jesus uh, through this account that we have. Um, and it, it is a really interesting story. It is about two guys who meet up with Jesus on a road that takes people from Jerusalem to a small town called Emmaus. So let's dive in. I'm going to read verse is uh, 13 to 16. Luke 24, verse 13 to 16. Here's what it says. Now that same day, this is the day uh, of the resurrection. This is the day that, that uh, Jesus certainly came out of the tomb. Okay. That same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked, they discussed these things with each other. Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you so much for today. I thank you that we have just these incredible historical accounts of, of people are encountering you and, 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 and having these conversations with you. And, and, and so Lord, I ask that as we look into your word that we would be encouraged by the fact that you still desire relationship with us. You still desire to speak to us. And so, Lord, as we look into your word, may we have eyes that see, may we have ears that hear, may we hearts that are open to you. In your name I pray. Amen. So, a question for you. Have you ever experienced or had the experience that uh, you can't see something that's like right in front of you? You ever have that kind of experience? Uh, to Janet's credit, my wife Janet, uh, she, she has like this incredible level of patience with me. Uh, I've often found myself looking for something in the pantry and unable to find it. And, and so I'm just staring and I'm looking at this, all the different stuff that's in the pantry and I just can't see what it is that I'm looking for. And so I call out to Janet and often she might be in a different room. And, this and so I'm just bellowing out, like basically, please, you know, have mercy on me and save me from this wretchedness that I find myself in. Uh, and so when I call out to her, uh, most of the time, very calmly, she tells me exactly what shelf that this item is that I'm looking for, how far back, and sometimes even when it's beside. And I don't understand how she's able to do that because I'm looking in there and I can't see what's right in front of me. Now, that's not really all that important in the scheme of things, right? But I wonder if this ever happens to us with big things in life. Like things that are right in front of us, but we don't necessarily see them. Where we're looking for something important, but we just can't see it. And I wonder sometimes if that's something that we have in our relationship with God. Right? Like when we look for God, but we can't sense His presence. We look for Him and we're told by people like myself, right? We're told by pastors and more spiritually attuned friends that He's right there we just can't see him for ourselves, right? Instead of sensing God, maybe you feel like he's gone or like he'll talk to anyone but you. Maybe that's what you feel. When you can't see God or sense Christ's presence, 
What do you do? You know, and that's a dark place to be. But I actually think this is where many of us find ourselves, and it's definitely where some of Jesus' followers found themselves on that Sunday following the crucifixion. The last time they saw Jesus, he was dead. He was gone. They thought he was likely never coming back. They made it through the last couple of days, but they're sad and they're depressed. And, and then they hear this word from several women that, who followed Jesus that his body wasn't in the tomb. And the angels had appeared to them telling them that Jesus was alive. That's what's going on here. It actually, it reads further and it says, talking about Jesus, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood there and their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. I find that one very entertaining, as if Jesus wouldn't know what happened in the last few days. Um, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet and powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is it's the third day since all this took place. Now that's, that's an indication that they understood that Jesus was saying on the third day he would rise. And so this is the third day and, and they don't see Jesus. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. Then they came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see Jesus. And so, again, the last time they saw him, he was dead. And these, there's these women that talked about angels and, and said that like he, his body's gone. That, that Jesus is alive. But they don't necessarily believe. They just feel more confused in the darkness. They've come to Jerusalem for the Passover feast and now it's time for them to go home. Right? And so these two friends were walking home from Jerusalem the village, to the village of Emmaus, which is about, again, the scripture says it's seven miles, uh, 10 kilometers. It's about the distance between Winkler and Morden. Uh, for those of you who are in this Pemina Valley region. Um, and they were talking about the crucifixion in the empty tomb. Jesus himself comes up and begins to walk alongside them. And this is the first time in Luke 24 where we see Jesus alive. Now all the other indications of Jesus being alive is that there's an empty tomb and these angels appeared and said that he's alive. But this here is where we see the first time Luke showing the living, breathing Jesus to his readers. And he does it in the most unassuming way. Jesus just starts walking alongside them. Now the Greek here says that their eyes were kept from recognizing him. All right, so there's something important here that we need to learn. It would have been simple for Jesus to just reveal himself to these disciples and say, see, hey, here I am. I am alive, I am resurrected. But instead, Jesus walks alongside them and, and keeps them from being able to recognize them. It's, it, it's kind of like the, the, the meaning of this word here, uh, the idea or the notion of keeping them from recognizing him. It's kind of like when you go to Walmart and you got your kid and your kid lunges, and like in the toy section, lunges at something, but you gotta kind of restrain them and hold them back from it. That's kind of the language here. There's this restraint holding them back from being able to recognize Jesus. And so their eyes wanted to see Jesus, but God restrains that detection and he holds them back. Now, why would he do that? Like that's important. And I believe that the rest of it kind of tells us why. God wants them to see Jesus. He wants us to see Jesus, but not just simply with our eyes. He wants us to first see Jesus in a different way. And here's what I mean. Uh, Luke 24, 17 and 18, he says, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces were downcast. So one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? 
And, and so Luke gives us the name, like first off, there's some things to note here. Luke gives us the name Cleopas because he's citing his source. Cleopas is the one telling him the story. And so he's showing that this account is reliable. And that's an important piece to remember. You go on to verse 19 and 21, what things Jesus asks. About Jesus of Nazareth, they reply, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. So they call Jesus a prophet. That's important. They no longer say Jesus was the Messiah or the Christ. It is suggested that to some extent they've lost a little bit of faith here. They were finding it too hard to believe, too dark. Jesus is dead. He must have been a prophet like the prophets of old who died. He can't possibly be the Messiah chosen by God. The Messiah is supposed to come and liberate the people and Jesus is dead. There's this darkness in the soul at this point. And when things get dark in our life, when we lose our jobs or a loved one dies and a tragedy happens, our hearts don't always sense Jesus. Sometimes they do. And we feel a peace that comes from the Lord that's unlike anything else. But sometimes we don't. Sometimes we feel the sense of darkness that's inside us. And it's easy to say, well, maybe he's not God. Maybe Jesus is not as powerful as I thought. But they were wrong. Cleopas and his companion were wrong. And so are we if we think that way. It carries on in verse 22. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us what they had seen, that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it was just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. And so in Israel, there was a concern about whether or not women could testify in court. Many thought that their witness was unreliable. And so if you're, if you're going to make up a story, if this was not a true thing that took place, this isn't the best way to do it. Like you wouldn't use the testimony of women in that day to do this because that discredits it. It doesn't give credit to it. But this is proof that the Bible's account is true. Instead of being written in a way to appear real in its culture and time, having men be the first witnesses, it's his historical account of what actually happened. Now, Cleopas and his traveling companion don't know um, about whether or not these things were true or not. They have trouble believing the women, citing the other disciples who didn't see Jesus, but their memories are selective in a few verses. Later... We see in verse 34 that they're going to remember that Jesus appeared to Simon Peter. And this is the only mention of this in the gospel accounts. When we're struggling, maybe we're fatigued, maybe we're frustrated and we can't see Jesus. And we can only think of everything wrong in our lives. I think we should pause and check our memories and ask, am I being selective in what I'm remembering? Am I being selective in what I'm remembering? Like how has Jesus done good things for me and shown me himself in ways in the past? And if he's been good to me in the past, why would I assume he would stop now? As a matter of fact, the Jewish um, community, like Israelites, every time God did something powerful within, within Israel, they would either... Um, set up an altar, actually very often in the Old Testament, they would set up an altar, and this would be an altar that every time you pass by it, you were to retell the story to your children. It was, it was a symbol of something that had taken place. And so the, the idea there was, you see, God's got us. Here's the story of God having us. And so when you feel downcast, when you feel distant, when you feel all these different things, let's not have a selective memory. Let's remember the movement of God amongst us. And the same is true, I suggest, for us today. But now it's time for Jesus to actually answer them. And he begins to open their eyes to him, not yet in the visible way that we, they would prefer, and quite frankly, that we would prefer as well. Instead, he actually points them to the Old Testament. So this is important. 
the reason that their eyes were not able to recognize Jesus is because Jesus wanted them to see him, but not just merely physically. He wanted them to see him through the scriptures. In Luke 22, 25 to 26, it says, he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets had spoken. So he's immediately saying, listen, like you're, you're not even listening to what the prophets have had to say on this. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And so Jesus exhorts them, he scolds them for not having hope, not realizing what's really happened here. They thought the Messiah was going to be a political liberator. But Jesus shows them that this isn't what the Messiah was going to do. He didn't come to be victorious like a military leader who, but rather actually to achieve victory in another kind of way, through his own suffering. So that seems like a confusing concept for them and all of the Jews because they didn't understand the Old Testament to say that the Messiah was going to suffer. Like They didn't get that. It's actually only in experiencing what's taking place that you're then able to look backward and say, oh, now I see. But if we were to look at two passages, for specifically Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, they tell us about the one who was chosen by God and will suffer, and especially the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. So Jesus, I'm oh, sorry, so just like our Messiah suffered, so too Christians will suffer, it says. God doesn't promise us a pain-free life where we will always feel the presence near us. But we'll go through a trial in darkness, and sometimes we're going to feel alone. James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. You know, the whole idea of consider pure joy when you experience trials and temptations of many kinds. You know, sometimes when we're in these trials and temptations, we don't feel like God is present. And that's why it's important for us to do exactly what was going on with Cleopas and his companion on the road to Emmaus. They didn't feel it. As a matter of fact, they felt a sense of hopelessness. And so it's a normal thing to go through times when we struggle to see Jesus because of everything else going on in life. But God can use this time to draw you nearer to him. One of the ways he does this is actually... Uh, drawing near to Christ. One of the ways we draw near to Christ is by meditating on and reading the scriptures. In Luke 2, 24 to 27, here's what it says. So Jesus is dealing with their hopelessness by pointing them to the scriptures so that they can see him throughout the scriptures and regain their hope. In verse 27, it says, and beginning with Moses. Now, this is all the, the writings of Moses, the first five books of the Bible believed to be written by Moses. So beginning with Moses, beginning with the beginning, and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures. Listen, concerning himself. He is showing them backwards everything that is said about him. Now, Jesus approach to dealing with their hopelessness. Jesus' approach to dealing with their desire to see him resurrected, to see him, is to point himself out in the scriptures and see the fulfillment of it. Jesus goes through a bird's eye view of the Old Testament to say that it's all pointing towards him. It's not that every single word is about Jesus, but they tell us about our sins so that our need of Jesus and of a coming Savior make more sense. Many passages even prefigure Jesus. And they tell us about him without telling us exactly. Here's what I mean. Opening chapters of Genesis talk about the descendant of Eve who's going to crush the serpent. That's Genesis 3.15. It doesn't name him as Jesus, but, but we understand that this is a messianic statement. Noah's Ark shows us that God's judgment, of what God's judgment is like against sin, and that we need rescue that only he can provide. The only reason Noah and his family were able to be surviving the flood was because of the provision of God. Abraham shows us the type of faith that we need to have in God and his promises. Abraham's son Isaac carries firewood, a tr tree up a mountain so that he can be a sacrifice just as Christ carries his cross. 
Joseph was betrayed by his brothers and Jesus was betrayed by disciples. Moses was almost killed by an evil king at his birth and so was Jesus. The whole sacrificial system of sheep and, and, and cows point to the need of a lasting sacrifice. Samson gave his life to rescue the people and so did Jesus. King David, a good but imperfect king, prefigures Jesus as a perfect king. And the list goes on and on as we think about all the ways that the scriptures point to Jesus. He is the fulfillment of all of it. And and, and so what's the application here on this one, right? It's simple. When you can't see Jesus, look to the scriptures. When you can't sense his presence, look to the scriptures. When we're blinded to him being around, look to to the scriptures. When we can't see what Jesus is doing in our lives or we can't hear him speaking to us, look to the scriptures. We go to our Bibles and we see him there. We hear him there. Now, I don't know if you've ever, if I've ever actually heard Jesus speak audibly to me. I, I get strong impressions and thoughts through prayer and things that seem like they're from him and the Holy Spirit. Does that count? Maybe. But at the same time, he does talk to me through his word. If you want to hear God's word, read his word. Read the scriptures. I do believe that as we read and meditate on the Bible, the Holy Spirit takes what we're reading and helps apply it to our hearts and our lives. And as these two travelers listen to Jesus talking, they begin to realize that they missed something. Jesus had come to liberate his people, but not as a mighty warrior, but rather as a sacrificial lamb. But still, God doesn't allow them to recognize the one standing in front of them is Jesus. And so now they've seen him in the scriptures, and you could say, so now they're ready, right? They've seen him in the scriptures, and so now they're ready. Luke 28 to 31, uh, Luke chapter 24, 28 to 31. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further, right? So it's like, yeah, you know, we're going to separate, we're going to have the conversation. I'm just going to move on a little further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And and you catch this? This is great. And he disappeared from their sight. But this time, When they can't see him, something different happens. We'll get to that. So Jesus pretends to keep on going, but like good hosts, they invite Jesus to stay with them uh, for the night. And and when he breaks bread, much like he did in the feeding of the 5,000 and and that he did at the Last Supper, then finally he stops restraining their eyes and they recognize him for who he is and he hands them the bread and then he's gone. And what do they immediately marvel at? You ready? Ready? The scriptures. This is what they marvel at. Not that he suddenly disappeared. Not that they saw him physically. They marvel at the scriptures. In verse 32, it says, They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? But we don't get to see Jesus like they did. And Luke knows that we, his contemporary audience, won't be able to see Jesus, so he wants us to go to the scriptures to see him. Remember the purpose of Luke's gospel. In Luke chapter one, verse one to four, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, but, sorry, fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that, listen, so that you will know with certainty the things that you have been taught. The more we understand God's word, the more our hearts burn for him. You want to sense God's presence? You want to know that Jesus is alive? Dive into his word. When you can't see Jesus, look to the scriptures. But they don't stop with the scriptures because they focus specifically on the resurrection. 
Jesus rising from the dead. Verse 33 to 35. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. So think about this, okay? Their response to Jesus no longer being present with them physically was to reflect on what they learned from the word and then to get up with excitement, right? It says they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told them of what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke bread. And so when they understand how all the scripture points to the Messiah needing to suffer and die and rise again, it changes everything. They believe. Like, of course, Eve would be, uh, the descendant of Eve would strike the serpent. Like he would crush the serpent's head and the serpent would strike his heel. Of course, Jesus is the one and final sacrificial lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Of course, the resurrection happened because it was the plan all along. There's a, a pastor, author by the name of Tim Keller, and he talks about a movie um, that came out back in 19, I think, 99. Um, and he, he, the movie is called The Sixth Sense. And he said, you can only see that movie twice. And I agree with him, having seen the movie. You can only see the movie twice because once you know the ending, it changes how you see the entire movie. The ending is shocking. You, now, I'm going to put this out there. If you don't know the ending or you haven't seen the movie, like, I'm sorry, but like it was 1999. So you play a little catch up on that, right? Bruce Willis is a child psychologist. He's trying to help a young boy see who sees dead people, and it turns out that Bruce Willis is actually one of the people that he sees who is dead. But Bruce is unaware of this. And if you rewatch the movie, it's obvious that he's dead. His wife doesn't look at him or interact with him. Nobody really talks to him except this young boy. You can't help but watch the entire movie considering the ending. But the story of Jesus it's kind of the opposite of the sixth sense in, that, in, in a way. When you get to the end, Jesus isn't dead, but he's alive. And the gospel is the good news that the hero of the story is alive and, and well. And now, as we go back through the scriptures, we can't help but seeing that good news. It's all about him. It's all pointing to our need for him. It's all about this coming savior who is going to pay the ultimate sacrifice. It's all about Jesus, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, this life-giving resurrection so that anyone who repents of their sins and puts their faith and trust in him will one day rise again as well. And when we're frustrated and we're discouraged and can't sense God's presence, that's exactly what we need to focus on the Bible, and how he rose again from the dead. And so, if you can't see Jesus, look to the scriptures and his resurrection, and especially this Resurrection Sunday. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much for the truth of your resurrection. I thank you so much that we're able to look through the entirety of scripture and we're able to see the plan unfolding. And, and, and Lord God, I just thank you so much that we're given that vantage point. And I thank you so much that you patterned something for us here. That you had disciples that were, well, they're downhearted. Like their, their hearts were heavy. They, no longer saw you as Messiah, they saw you as a prophet who was powerful in word and deed. And, and, and you show them through your word everything that was supposed to happen, everything that's related to you. And they begin to see. And so Lord God, I thank you so much that we have the scriptures that help us to see you when we can't feel you. Would you help us to be a people who lean into them so that we're governed by truth not by emotion. In your name I pray, Lord. Amen.